I'm an economic theorist. Uh, I'm mostly interested not in particular topics in economics, but in how economists do their business, which is what theorists do. So this is, may seem a little dry, but you know, this is a, what one end of the business school does when they want to talk about how the discipline does what it does. In particular, uh, I'm going to give you a look at the research program I've been on. It's a little short on details. It's going to be long on slides. And I have 55 <laughs> minutes to get through this. What is it about? Well, my research program is about dynamic choice. Uh, economists have a way, I'll describe that way in a bit, as to how to model, deal with dynamic choice when they go out and try and understand dynamic choices that people make. Uh, I'm interested in providing economists with more realistic, more consistent with observed behavior models of dynamic choice. So that's the research program. Now, to understand what that means and why there's an issue here, uh, we got to take a step back. And the step back is to talk about how economics as a discipline works. So let's do that. Economists do two things. They talk about people, sometimes firms, making choices. Not any choices, but consistent choices. So a lot of the subject is about what's called choice theory. How does this person choose? How does that person choose? What's the basis on which they choose? Always with consistent choices. And then they talk about how those choices are equilibrated in various institutional settings. Normally markets, but increasingly other institutional settings. Uh, Mike Harrison, how many people here know Mike Harrison? Right, okay. So Mike Harrison, uh, who's just recently retired, another institution in the school, or an institution in the school, describes these two pieces as the first is the theory of cats, and the second is the theory of cats in a bag. <laughs> so you should think of that. Now, economists are somewhat, um, oh, what's the word? They, they like to extend their influence wherever they can. And so they sometimes, instead of calling them consistent choices, they say it's rational choices. And I think it's a bad, you know, the, the, the implied pejorative is that choices that don't conform to the economic model are irrational. That's bad language. I'd like to avoid that language. So I'm going to use the word consistent choices. So there's choices, and then there's the equilibration. I'm all about the choices part of the subject. So what is consistent choice to an economist? Uh, it's everything but the following. So a man walks into a roadside diner and says, I want a piece of pie and a cup of coffee, please. Waitress says, we have apple and peach pie today. Guy says, in that case, I'd like a piece of apple pie. She says, I just remembered, we have one slice of banana cream left as well. And he says, you also have banana cream? Well, in that case, give me peach. <laughs> OK. <laughs> right. That's the one thing that economists don't want to deal with. OK? Consistent choice is everything but what that guy just did. Now, it's more formal. Uh, formally, if an economic agent chooses an object x and not y when both of them are available, then she never chooses y when x is available. Having shown that she likes x more than y, she should always like x more than y. That's consistent choice to an economist. And as long as that property holds, we can model her choices. It's a mathematical theorem. We can maximize her choices as if she's maximizing a numerical function that maps every option into a number. And she's going to take whatever option has the biggest number. Now, there are some technical conditions that you have to meet for that really to follow from just that property there. But they're not very stiff uh, conditions. In particular, if the universe of things she can choose is finite, the only thing you have to add to that condition, the formally condition, is that you give her a set of objects to choose from, and she says, OK, I'll have this one, or if you prefer this one or this one. She makes a choice. She doesn't stand there and say, oh, I can't choose. That plus the first thing, that means you can model her choices if she's maximizing utility. And that's what economists do. They say consumers are utility maximizers. Now, in special circumstances, especially when there's uncertainty in the world, we might make more structural assumptions on the nature of her choice, uh, say that she maximizes expected utility or subjective expected utility. But by and large, the essence of economic choice is that level of consistency, nothing else. Now, empirically, it doesn't work. And a good example comes from the marketing literature. Designer of a mail order catalog uh, says, you know, he's, he's trying to design a web page or a catalog page. 
to get you to pay $200 to buy a particular printer. He wants you to choose the printer over keeping $200 in your pocket. So how does he do that? Well, he might do one of two things. He'll advertise two printers on the page, the one he wants you to buy for $200, and a second one which has a few more features at a much higher price. And you're supposed to conclude, wow, that $200 printer is a great deal. You know, I only get a little bit more for $350, I'll buy the $200 printer. Or, going the other way, he advertises the printer he wants you to buy, and a second, much worse printer for $190. So you say, gee, I just have to spend $10 more, I get all these extra features, that $200 printer is a great deal. Now, the guy who's designing the, the web page here is exactly playing on the frame that you put the choice into, which is the one thing economists don't like. They don't want the frame to influence your choice. So, you know, this is just like the availability of banana cream pies seemed to frame the choice between apple and peach in a way that got the guy to change what he's doing. That's what you're doing there, and people do that. Nonetheless, economists say, no, they don't. Right? <laughs> Economic models, by and large, have kept to the consistent choice model of individual behavior because they say, once we admit that frames change what you're doing, there's not much we can say about your choices. So, economists ignore that kind of stuff, which the marketing people love because that way they make fun of us. But uh, economists believe in consistent choice as a good way to attack problems of economic choice in the world. Now, what's dynamic choice? Right, that's the subject I'm interested in. Uh, if I'm choosing a kind of pie to eat at a railroad side restaurant or whether to buy a particular printer, that's a static choice. Right at the moment, I have a choice between different things. I choose to spend my money on the printer. I choose to have apple pie or peach pie or whatever. It happens, it's over. If we're talking about what career you're going to follow or where to go to school or how much you're going to save, that's more of a dynamic choice. First of all, the choice you make today is going to affect the opportunities you have tomorrow for future choices. And today's choice needs to be informed about the value that you attach to tomorrow's opportunities or lack of opportunities. So it's that kind of choice, the choice of career, how much to save, where to go to school. Those are dynamic choices because they have implications going forward in the future. Those are the kind of choices that I'm interested in. Now, how do economists model dynamic choice? Well, they use the statically optimized strategically and then just do it, or <laughs> sat swoosh approach. Uh, what is this approach? Well, it starts off with modeling the problem, the choice problem that the individual has. So you have a decision maker who faces a dynamic decision problem. There are choices to be made today, but also tomorrow, next month, next year. We have a bunch of dates at which the decision maker has to make choices. That's the start. There are connections between the choices. What you choose today will have an influence on what options you're going to have to choose tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. So your choices today not only impact what you get today, but what choices you'll have in the future. While you're making these choices, information may arrive that you can use in, use in making later choices. So you think about what information am I going to get later on, and your choices today can affect what information you do or do not get. So it's a very complex structure that economists will start by modeling. That's the dynamic decision problem the person has. And for every dynamic decision problem, there's a range of strategies that the person can do. Things that say, well, today I'm going to choose this option. And tomorrow, if I get this information between now and tomorrow, I'll make this choice. If I get this other information, I'll make that choice. A full, what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, in all the situations that I'm going to have to make choices, that's a strategy. And we first formulate all the strategies that we have in this decision problem. And then, every strategy we have, maps into an outcome. How much I get to eat today, tomorrow, the next day. Possibly the outcome is random. There's uncertainty in the world. In which case we think of the distribution over our consumption over many days as the outcome. The, the, the outcome is the distribution of possible consumption streams we have. And what we do as in this Satswoosh approach is we say, okay, here's a strategy. Let me write a little bit on the board. So here's my decision problem. With a whole bunch of structural stuff. And that gives us a set of strategies. 
Now, each strategy gives us an outcome, what we're going to get. So that's outcome from strategy number one. This is the outcome from strategy number oh, 7,321,000. I mean, they, lots of strategies. A uh, typical decision problem in the finance literature goes on forever. You have an infinite number of strategies. And what you do is for every strategy you have over here, you figure out what will be the outcome for me. And then you say, I've got preferences or utility over the outcomes so that I look at every strategy I could do. I look at what outcome it produces. I look at how good an outcome that is for me. I figure out that this is the outcome. Or the, yeah, this is the outcome. Out of all the possible outcomes I could have from all the possible strategies, that's the outcome that maximizes my utility, which means this is the best strategy to play. That's what I'm going to do. And then mindlessly, I just implement that strategy through time. So you choose at the outset, right? We're sitting at this decision problem. I'm about to choose where to go to school that has an impact on my career. I think through the entire scheme of my life, what's going to happen to me? For the next you know, 60 years, what are the strategies I could have for 60 years? What's the outcome from every strategy? Which of those outcomes do I like the best? That means I should go to Dartmouth, where I went. Once I have that strategy in mind, I just do it. That's the, just, that's the swoosh part of this. That's the way economists model dynamic choice. At the outset, pick a strategy, pick an optimal strategy based on the outcomes and just implement. Uh, this is viewed by economists as obvious. This is how you would make the right decision. Uh, and it's so obvious, you know, I've, I've written a couple of economics textbooks. In every economics textbooks I've ever written, I discuss the problem of dynamic choice and what is the standard approach. I don't call it satsush in the books, but that's essentially what it is. And it's the only textbooks that ever discuss this. Everybody else says, well, it's obvious. That's what you're going to do. Uh, it's just unworthy to talk about the assumptions that go in to this particular way of viewing dynamic choice. So uh, well, before I get to that, yeah, nobody really believes that people sit down trying to pick a college, thinking through their entire lifetime. It's an as-if model. And the idea there is that it's not how people think about things. But the way they behave is as if that's what they did. A good example here is you go back to uh, utility maximization, the basic model of economics. I mean, if you read an economics textbook, it says when you go over to the grocery store, you got money in your pocket, you got a list of things you might buy, you consult your utility function, you consult your budget constraint, you optimize subject to a budget constraint. Now, nobody does that, right? You go down the aisle with your cart, you look at something, you say, that looks good, I'll put that in the cart. You know, occasionally what happens is you go down another aisle, you say, oh, that looks even better, and you go back to the aisle and put something back. You make your choices sort of as you go along. Well, economists say, okay, that's how you make choices, but it's as if when you're in Safeway, you're maximizing your utilities subject to a budget constraint. It's not how you think about it, but it's the net result of what you do. And there's a famous analogy, which is due to Milton Friedman, that says that well, let me give you a good example of an as-if model. Trees in the spring decide where to put their leaves. And a good as-if model of how trees set their leaf canopy is as if they're maximizing their exposure to sun over the course of a day. Now, trees don't really do the calculation, right? I mean, trees have trouble with simple sums. But if you model the setting of a leaf canopy as if a tree was maximizing it, it turns out to be a pretty good and useful model of how the tree will set up its leaf canopy. So this is viewed as an as-if model. It's not how people make choices. People don't sit down and think about things this way, but their choices are as if they do this. And so maybe that works at Safeway. Uh, there's empirical evidence on both sides, uh, evidence that says, yeah, people roughly conform as if they were maximizing utility subject to a budget constraint. The marketing guys come in and tell us about the way they design mail-auto catalogs to make this model not work. But in particular, 
the question I, I, I've asked for you know, many years now is, is a good as if model of dynamic choice, is there something about the dynamics of the choice that says that the Satzwoosh approach is not a good as if model? So that's what I'm interested in is not so much what's the answer to that question. I say the answer to that question is no. It's really what are the reasons it's not a good model and then what are you going to do about it? So I've got three reasons that I think it's not a good as if model of dynamic choice. First of all, people's tastes change. Okay, you're making a decision here, where to go to school, stuff like that. Well, you know, three years down the line, you may decide, you know, I thought that's where the path I wanted to follow, but it's not, I'm going to follow a different path. And I'll get back to this in a minute. It has two and to some extent contradictory consequences for the nature of decisions I make as I go along, the fact that I recognize that my taste will change. There are things that you can't anticipate. Sitting here, thinking about what you're going to do for the rest of your life when you're choosing where to go to school, you know something unanticipated is going to happen to you, you know, in your sophomore year, let alone five years out on the job. And the actions you take today take account of the fact that you know there are things you can't anticipate. So that's reason number two. And third, you know, this problem is just too hard to think about. It's too complex. You can't really do the optimization. You know, so this is strategy 7,321,000, et cetera. I mean, there are an infinite number of strategies. And nobody in most realistic problems can figure out which is the best according to some numerical measure. So you couldn't do this if you wanted to, if you had all the data. Instead, what people do is they follow heuristic decision rules. And those heuristic decision rules can't always be justified using this approach. If you use a heuristic decision rule, it's not as if you are solving an optimization problem like this. So in each of those three, what I'm going to do now is talk about each of those three, what there is, and a little bit about what I've worked on in that particular regard. So first of all, changing tastes. Now, you can't doubt people's tastes change as time passes. Uh, you plan you're going to do something. In the middle, you say, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to go do something else. Uh, I do that a lot. Now, the question is, if you know your tastes are going to change, is that going to affect what you do today? And there are three options, at least in economic modeling, that you have to say three answers to the question, what are you going to do about it today, knowing that your taste may change? One option is nothing. What you say is, well, my taste might change. I don't care. Today, I'm going to figure out what I think is best for me, given my taste today. I'll keep going until my taste change, and then I'll change my plan. A little bit more sophisticated is you constrain your later choices so you get what you want today. And uh, this goes the. The original story here uh, comes from the um, Odyssey. Uh, when Odysseus is going past the Isle of the Sirens, he knows that once he hears the siren song, his tastes are going to change. He's going to throw himself off. So he constrains himself. He has them tie him. He has his sailors tie him to the mast so that he can't have the option of throwing himself off the ship later on. More modern examples that people talk about, and as one deals with me, is I try to make sure that there isn't any sweet food in the refrigerator late at night because I know if it's there late at night, my will will get weaker and I'll start eating that stuff. Uh, one of the original papers on this uh, was about Christmas clubs. Why do people, you know, do people even know what a Christmas club is anymore? How many people know what a Christmas club is? Okay, so for those of you who don't, used to be a big thing, uh, at least when I was being raised in, in New Jersey a long time ago, is that the banks would very happily take some money from you every week or every month and not let you have it until two weeks before Christmas. The idea, idea being is that, you know, if you start putting money away in a regular bank account, you can always withdraw it, and then the money won't be there for Christmas. But if you put the money in a Christmas club, you can't touch it until it's time to go buy the Christmas presents. This is a way to force yourself to save and not spend the money. And the banks used to love this because it paid no interest. I mean, you know, so this was, the, the, the banks are holding your money for you, not letting you have access to it. Well, that's exactly this idea that, you know, you'd know at some point you might want to spend the money that you're saving for Christmas presents. So we'll make sure you can't get at it. Well, you've constrained yourself by going there. 
Now, a very recent but pretty large literature about this is about hyperbolic discounting. Uh, hyperbolic discounting is the following phenomenon. I give you a choice between, so this is a choice, between $100 uh, today or, let's see, what's a good number, a hundred and twenty next week. So I give you that choice. A lot of people, I don't know if I quite got the right numbers here, but a lot of people say, well, I prefer a hundred dollars today. But if I give you the choice of a hundred dollars in 51 weeks, or 120 in 52 weeks, then people say, oh, well, you know, 51 weeks, 52 weeks, what difference does it make? $20 is good. So they go that way. And the problem is, is that in 51 weeks, if I offered you the choice of $100 today or $120 next week, you'd say, oh, I made a mistake. I want the $100 today. So that's hyperbolic discounting. It, it's, as time passes, you put a lot of weight on immediate consumption versus next week, the difference between 51 weeks and 52 weeks isn't as great, and that's going to shift as you get closer and closer to 51 and 52 weeks out. Now, what are the consequences of this? Well, it affects how much money you save, the form you save it in. In particular, today, if you think that you know, your preferences for 51 versus 52 weeks are right, you want to lock in money that you save so that you don't pull the money out with a big penalty, stuff like that. Subject of some, OK. So you could do nothing. You could constrain your later choices. On the other hand, with sort of the exact opposite, you say, look, I don't know what my future tastes are going to be. But what's important to me today is to give myself the option to do what's best for myself, what I think will be best for myself, later on. So this goes with the following sort of story. You're making reservations at a restaurant. You're not going to go to this restaurant for three weeks, so you're making reservations way in advance. How big a menu of choices? So today you're picking the menu of the restaurant. And suppose there was menu one and menu two. And you look at menu one, you say, yeah, you know, there's some good stuff there. Menu two, there's some good stuff there. On balance, I prefer menu one to menu two, so this one is better. But if there was a super restaurant that had menu one and two all in the same menu, why not go with this in case something on that menu three weeks from now is going to have a lot of appeal to me? So that's, you know, I prefer for flexibility. I want to leave myself the flexibility to make a choice later on because I don't know what my tastes are going to be. I don't know what my preference is going to be later on, but I don't want to constrain myself today. I want to allow my later self to have what it wants. So that's completely different from number two. Number two, you're saying, what I want today is what I want to force myself later on to have. Now you're saying, well, what I'm going to want later on is what I should allow myself to have. Two different, very different ways of dealing with the idea that tastes are changing. So. My interest in this, the constrain your later self, the thing that goes with hyperbolic discounting and Christmas clubs, it's a big important topic. Lots of work has been done in economics. Not me. This is not something I've ever worked on. Instead, I work on the two other things, the two other directions. The leave yourself flexibility direction, well, a paper I wrote back in 1979, a long time ago, says, OK, if you think your tastes are going to change, exactly what is the form that this preference for flexibility will take. So trying to say mathematically, how do I put together a formal model, which is what economists do, how do I put together a formal model of this kind of preference for flexibility where it's being driven by the fact I don't know what my future taste will be and I want to give my later self the chance to make a choice. So that's one thing I've worked on. The other thing is something I'm working on right now, which I find very fascinating. This is, comes out of my 10 years as a senior associate dean. Uh, I'm very interested in motivation and how do you motivate people. Now, you, you know, you guys deal with the faculty, so it won't surprise you to learn that they're a hard group to manage. 
right? Uh, no, it won't surprise you. In particular, you know, as senior associate dean, you got the job of motivating them to do what's good for the school and not what they want to do, necessarily. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about motivation, especially in the context of the faculty. Now, economists, if you go to an economist and you say, OK, we're talking about motivation. on the job, motivating faculty members at the GSB to spend time thinking about their teaching, actually put some effort into teaching the MBAs, not spending all their time doing research or whatever else it is they do. Uh, you say to an economist, I've got a question about motivation on the job. An economist, a standard economist says, I know the answer to your question. The answer to your question is incentives. Right? Economists have one answer to motivation, which is pay them more money if they do good stuff. That's it. So this is the economist's answer. Uh, promise more money if the employee does good stuff. Now, the problem with this theory of incentives, uh, it's a theory that is very important in economics. Uh, it's one of the things I think we're now up to like three Nobel Prizes given for various aspects of the theory of incentives. The big issue in incentive theory is when good stuff happens, do you know that it's because of what the employee did? If there's uncertainty, between what the person tries to do and what the outcome actually is, promising them more money if they do good stuff, well, what it should say, if the employee seems to have done good stuff, and that introduces uncertainty into the employee about their compensation. If I tell my fellow, my fellow instructors or fellow professors, I will pay you more money if you, I'll give you a bonus, if your teacher ratings are very high, they can try to get their teacher ratings very high, but it might not work. And they don't like the uncertainty in their compensation. Worse than that, another problem with this is that if I tell them, you know, I'll give you a lot more money if your ratings get high, what are they going to do? They're going to start pandering to the students. Right? I don't want them to pander to the students. It's just that I can't tell whether the high ratings are due to pandering or to the fact that they're actually teaching a better course. So there's an economic theory of incentives, which for the kind of job at least that faculty members have, and a lot more jobs besides, including you know, the kind of jobs you have, it doesn't really work very well. It works a little bit, but not very well. That's what economists do. Now, go across the street to my friends in OB. He is particularly the social psychologists. They have very different theories about motivation. I have theories that say, talk about self-determination and self-perception. And in particular, let me give you an illustration of this, which is a hospital in Boston called Beth Israel. Uh, anybody here from Boston? No. OK. So Boston has a lot of hospitals. In particular, there's a, there's a little district of town known as the Hospital District, which has Massachusetts General. And Brigham and Women's, and Beth Israel, and there's one more of the four is a hospital called Deaconess. All of these are the Harvard Medical School teaching hospitals. They are the hospitals where you know people who are at Harvard Medical School go and staff. They take rounds there, stuff like that. Residents at these hospitals, are connected to the Harvard Medical School, stuff like that. Now, it's very clear in the 1970s, when this story begins, that there was a clear pecking order amongst these hospitals, and it was Mass General was the best. Brigham and Women's number two, Beth Israel three, Deaconess number four. And everybody agreed, you know, the prestige positions were in Mass General. New guy comes to Beth Israel as CEO, a guy named Brabkin. This is around 1972, I think. 
and he wants to move up in the pecking order. So he's trying to figure out what can I do to make Beth Israel stand out and maybe be as thought of as good as Mass General. And he hit on a system of we're going to become, so his theory or his strategy is become the hospital patients prefer. So he's going to emphasize service to the patients. And in particular, the way he did this is he went to the senior RNs, the senior registered nurses, and he said, we're going to do nursing differently here. We are going to have what's called primary nursing. If a patient comes and is going to be a hot patient at Beth Israel, that person is assigned a primary nurse. It's like you meet your doctor. You meet your primary nurse. You sit down. And your primary nurse, and I'll use she because most of them were she's at the time, your primary nurse is dealing with you and maybe two, possibly three other patients at any one time. When she's on duty for eight, her eight-hour shift, she's doing everything for you. She's managing your care. She's cleaning up your bed, stuff like that. But she's also the center of your care. The doctors talk to her about what needs to be done next for you. Uh, when she's off duty, the, the, the 16 hours a day she's off duty, she's still on call if there's an issue about you. You know, primary nurses would get phone calls at 3 in the morning saying, the family of one of your patients has a concern. Talk to them. Okay. Now, did they give the nurses more money for doing this? No. And the net result of this is that the nurses loved it. They thought this was great. The cue to become a primary nurse at Best Israel for people who are nurses at Mass General, Brigham or Women's, just got bigger and bigger and bigger. What they did is they enriched the job content. Being a nurse, you were doing something. You were doing something important. You were getting psychological rewards for doing that something important. And the nurses responded really, really well to that. Now, it's a great story, except it has a very bad outcome, a bad ending, which is primary nursing is a little more expensive. And as times change, subsequent CEOs said, well, we've got to get rid of primary nursing. It's too expensive given the way we're compensated. And as you can imagine, it was a disaster. They made a psychological contract with the nurses, which they then broke. And breaking a psychological contract is much worse. Well, OK. So this all fits in with the psychological theory of self-determination, which says people will give you better output. Employees will give you better output if they have more self-determination, if they're doing something as important, they perceive as important if they're connected to other people doing the same sort of thing, and also with the theory of self-perception, which is people, when they do stuff, they try and figure out after the fact, why did I behave in this particular way? If they did it because they got a bonus, they say, I'm doing it for the money. And then they will continue to do things for the money. Whatever it takes to get the bonus is what they'll do. If, on the other hand, they say, they do it because my patients are important to me or because I love the work, they will increasingly love the work. They will think that their patients, they'll internalize the welfare of their patients more. Well, that, from economic terms, as social psychologists don't think of it this way, but from a point of view of economics, what is that? That's what you do and how you do it and what reward you get for it changes your taste, changes your utility function. So one of the projects I'm working on and not meeting with greatest of success because my colleagues in economics really don't like to talk about changing tastes that much. But what I'm trying to do is convince them that things like this are real, they're important, and you know, I won't go into all the ways I tried to manipulate my colleagues when I was associate dean, but <laughs> I was trying. Uh, you know, this is more important motivational force than the stuff that economists say is important. But if you want to talk about it in economic terms, you have to talk about changing tastes and the way people's tastes change. What changes them? How do they change? And that takes you from economics into psychology. You've got to understand social psychology, cognitive psychology, and try to import that to economics. So one of the things that I'm doing right now, one of the things that I think is very important for economics, is to try and do better on how tastes change, and then what's the impact on that for dynamic choice. Okay, so that's number one, changing tastes. Unanticipated contingencies. Um, in the Sas-Swoosh model, every contingency that might ever be realized is anticipated. 
And each one is given its probability. This has probability 1 in 10 million. This one has probability 1 in 1,000. You do a grand optimization over all those things. Now, formally, you could have things that you don't anticipate. It's just that you make no allowance for them in the decisions you make today because they have zero probability, you thought. Now, there's a sub branch of economics called transaction cost economics. Uh, one of the great pioneers of this is, is a guy up at Berkeley named Ollie Williamson. Um, and point out, Ollie got the Nobel Prize for, for all the work he did on transaction cost economics, which says, you know, the standard economic model, the Satswoosh model, applied to relationships between two firms, or relationships between an employee and an employer, doesn't make any sense because the world is not driven by the things you can anticipate. It's driven by the things you can't anticipate in a long-term relationship. And so what's important in understanding when a relationship will be efficient or not is not what do you plan is going to happen, but how do you plan to meet the things that you didn't anticipate. That's what transaction cost economics is all about. It's about the governance structure, which is who has which decision rights when decisions later on have to be made that you didn't anticipate. So, you know, that's what unanticipated, that's why unattended, Unanticipated contingencies is important. And my contribution, as I go back to this paper I talked about before about preference for flexibility, viewed one way, say, I want to model the idea that my taste will change. What are the consequences for the choices I make over menus? This goes the other way. It says, if I see the choices that you make over menus, and you have preference for flexibility, what are the consequences for how I model your choices. What sort of expected utility model, model do I use? And so there's a paper in 1979, follow-up papers in 86 and 92. I won't go into a lot of details about this because this is old business for me, but trying to come to grips with the idea that there are unanticipated contingencies that you prepare for, very important in economics and in long-term relationships, very important to dynamic choice, and uh, not something that economists have been very good at, with the exception of the people who follow Ollie. And then finally, there's complexity in heuristics. What's the issue here? Well, most dynamic decision problems are amazingly complex. In fact, they're far too complex for any economist to solve. Uh, so when you have papers in economics that talk about dynamic decision problems, you have one of two choices. You either assume that the consumers in your model, your model of economy, are solving problems that you know you could never solve. And there's a whole literature, literature on general equilibrium that assumes people sitting here today, a lot of finance is this way too, people sitting here are making portfolio decisions, making projections of future prices of things. Nobody can make those projections. But we assume our agents can and we derive results based on the assumption that they can. Oh, okay. Or, when you want to be a little more structural, you only deal with the kinds of problems that you can solve, which is tremendously limiting in the, the, the range of dynamic decision problems the economists will actually talk about. So uh, let me give you an example of a problem that's pretty simple to describe and pretty difficult to solve. Contemplate hiring staff for a professional service firm that takes on projects. So you are in charge of hiring the staff for this for professional services firm. As you look at the potential employees, you're unsure how valuable different candidates will be. So you've got a bunch of candidates. There they are. And they all are carrying their CVs. And they all have letters of recommendation. That's not going to tell you exactly how good they're going to be. And it's certainly not going to tell you how well they'll work together. Will this guy with this CV and this, these letters of recommendation, will these people work well together or not? So how do you find out who's good, who's not? Well, you hire them, you set them to work, and you see how it goes. So the question is, you look at the CVs, you look at what information you have, you know you don't have complete information, and then you got to decide, who do I hire? Okay, very standard problem. And it's not just hiring people, it's what tools do you use, what assets do you provide for yourself? Uh, questions at the outset, is how many people do you hire on your team? Do you want to build in some redundancy? And in particular, suppose you need, you know, there's this particular specialty. So these people are part of a specialty. You need one person on your team with that specialty. You've got, let's say, three candidates. You don't know which one of those three candidates is going to be the best. So should you hire two of them and find out? 
So you just hire one and hope that person works out. Understanding that if you hire one person and they work out kind of okay, you got no information about how those two guys are going to do. If you hire two of them, at least you'll have information about how good each of them is, and then you can make a choice. Very simple problem to describe. Impossible to solve. You cannot solve, if, if I formally describe this with a model, with uncertainty, stuff like that, this is an example of what's called a multi-arm bandit problem. Okay, and just see, anybody heard the term before? One, two. Okay, so what is a multi arm bandit problem? It's called a multi arm bandit problem because it's about a slot machine. So here is a slot machine in Las Vegas, which has the following weird characteristic for a slot machine there's an arm on this side, and there's an arm on this side. And here's the slot where you put your money, you put your coin. You put your coin in, and that enables you to pull one arm or the other. But you can't pull both. Now, you don't know what is the return from this arm of the bandit. You don't know what the return is from that arm of the bandit. And the only way you can get information is by pulling the arm. So suppose, let's take a very simple case. Suppose you knew that this arm wins Oh, 10% of the time. And you think this arm wins 5% of the time or 14% of the time, and each of those is equally likely. Well, then, if you're only going to pull one arm once, this arm is better on average. But if you got a little bit of time, Maybe you want to try this arm a few times, collect statistics on how often it wins, and see, you know, am I getting the 14% machine? Because then I know that's the machine I want to play. That's the arm I want to play. That's a multi-arm bandit problem, is you got a course of different actions you could take. You're not sure what the returns from each course of action is, and the only way to find out is to try it. Well, this is a multi-arm bandit problem. Now, the solution, how do you optimally play the multi-arm bandit. This was a very difficult problem for years and years. When I started in 1975, sort of at the business school, when I was in graduate school in 1972, this was an unsolved problem in any sense. Nobody knew how to solve this problem. And then a guy came along named Gittins who said, well, in the very special case where there's no information about this arm in what goes on there, and vice versa, where the arms, the uncertainty about them is independent. You don't learn anything about one arm by pulling another arm. Then here's how you solve the problem. And it's a beautiful solution. I mean, it's a brilliant piece of work. The problem is, this is a multi-arm banded problem, where the arms are the different teams you could assemble. And those are certainly not independent. If I hire this guy, and this guy, and this guy, I learn a hell of a lot about the performance of a team that just consists of those two. So they're not independent. Nobody has a clue how to solve this problem. And you know, there's good reason to believe. Computer scientists, OR guys, have been working on this problem. Good, good reason to believe that no one will ever be able to solve these until we get computers which are much faster, much faster than any computer we have today. So what are you going to do about this? Um, well, people will use heuristics on how to solve this problem. What's an example of a heuristic? Uh, the best example I can give you of a heuristic comes from the book and then the movie Moneyball. People know about the, the book and the movie Moneyball. So this is about the Oakland general manager, Billy Bean. And the heuristic that people used to use in baseball in assembling a team of baseball players is they would send old baseball players out to watch them play and sort of says, you know, I think this guy is better than that guy based on how he looks. And the big innovation that Moneyball talks about is Billy Bean said, eh, you know, screw how people look, give me their statistics. And in particular, both in the book and the movie, he talks about how do you assemble a lineup in a baseball team? You add up their on-base averages. That's a simple heuristic. Now, is that the right thing to do? Obviously not. 
but it's a rule that gets you a decision. You get a team out on the field which has maximized the sum of their on-base averages. You got a team out there, and you know you hope it's a good heuristic. So what I'm doing, this is in a uh, project that I'm doing with a former student now at Bocconi named Alejandro Francetich. Some of you may know Alejandro. What we're doing is we are looking at different heuristics for solving this problem over here and seeing how well they perform based on simulations. Now, we have no idea how they perform relative to the optimal heuristic because no, or the optimal strategy because nobody knows what the optimal strategy is, but at least we can say this heuristic is better than that. And to give you an example, uh, a simple heuristic which you can find in textbooks on, uh, on uh, managerial accounting is the heuristic, does the person pay for himself or herself? I hire this person, this person, this person, say this is the team that I assemble. I let them work together for a few months. And then I say, OK, how much value has this guy generated? How much has he cost me in terms of salary? Has he paid for himself? If he does, I'll keep him. If he hasn't, I fire him. OK, there's a heuristic. Terrible. I mean, you can quickly figure out even theoretically why, but that heuristic just it is bad heuristic. On the other hand, there's a closely related heuristic called the incremental value heuristic, which actually does pretty well against all other heuristics but one. There's one heuristic that, that we find in the paper that does great. The only problem is it's a really hard heuristic to implement. I mean, it takes a lot of computer power just to get the heuristic to work. But so what's the point of this? What we're trying to do is we're saying, look, we can't solve this problem. But this is an important problem in dynamic choice. People facing this sort of problem, uh, you know, they're going to use heuristic. What heuristic, what can we discover by simulating this situation? Which heuristics seem to do well? Why do they do well? When do they do well? OK. Now, uh, yeah, there's been in economics literature, uh, this is uh, something that keeps coming up like every 10 or 15 years. Uh, there was a period of time in the uh, late 70s through the late 80s where people were interested in heuristics for learning what information can be gained from market prices. And I've got one paper there with uh, Margaret Bray. Although uh, Tom Sargent, who used to be at Hoover and the economics department, has now gone to NYU. Uh, Tom is the real hero of this particular literature. In particular, if you have a taste for books in economics, Tom has this brilliant book called uh, The Conquest of American Inflation, which describes what happened in the end of the Carter administration and the early days of the Reagan administration. Why is it that all of a sudden we got rid of stagflation? We got rid of the inflation part of stagflation. His story is basically that the way economists thought about modeling the economy was with a heuristic called ordinary least squared regression. So they were regressing. They didn't know the model that they were using, the statistical model they were using, was not right, but you know, it was close. And so we'll pretend like it's right, we'll do what it says. And uh, basically, what he said is when you run ordinary least squared regression on the data they were looking at, they got lucky. Right? The policy prescriptions that came out were just, you know, by luck, they got a series of numbers that told them to do what was right. They never would have figured it out on their own. Very nice book. Uh, then, you know, a few years later, there was a literature on how to play games against random opponents. And this is something I've, you know, I wrote a bunch of papers with a guy named Drew Fudenberg on. And now, as I said, I'm looking at precisely this kind of problem, precisely this problem over here with uh, Alejandro. OK, so I've got five minutes left, and I was hoping to leave a little bit of time for questions, but here's my bottom line. Dynamic decisions made by economic actors, they're the most important decisions, economic decisions that people make. And they're the ones that we really want to understand the best. Unfortunately, the way that economists go about trying to understand those decisions, they use the Sasswoosh model. They use it over and over again. And it's inadequate, even as an as-if model. It just doesn't really capture what goes on. Uh, you know, this has been a 30, 40 year battle. Mainstream economists resist moving away from Sasswoosh because they think, well, you know, you're not being rational anymore. You know, we know what rationality is, and this is 
saying people behave irrationally, and if we do that, you know, we'll become sociologists and we'll get paid like sociologists. Don't want to do that at all. Uh, but, you know, the business of economics, I should say, the business of economics ought to begin modeling how real people make economic decisions and not how some ideal pe people from another planet do so. And if that gets us a sociologist salaries, that's too bad. So, uh, you know, I've spent 40 years nibbling around the edges of dynamic choice. I hope the discipline will begin to take some bigger bites out of this subject because it's really, really important and they don't do a good job of it at all. <laughs>